Hi everybody, welcome back to At Home Learning with Miss Ellis. Um, we are on lesson 18, so if you're just joining us, the brief introduction I always give is that this is a sequence of lessons. So if you're just finding this one, I strongly suggest going back to lesson one and building up, um, or at the very least, this is the second lesson in a mini unit, so you should go back to lesson 17. Um, just because I am layering skills, that's the, the difference between what I'm trying to do here with what you would do just with one-off videos. So this is meant to be lessons that would be like structured and chronological like I would do in class. So they're meant to sort of build skills and get more complicated as you go along. So that's my advice. Um, I am asking this to be done collectively, like as a family with an adult there to facilitate the conversation. Um, I'm trying to keep this away from being passive learning where kids are just sitting and watching something, but where they're actually answering and responding, which is really the piece that's missing. So um, please try to make that happen. Uh, the lessons are between 20 and 40 minutes, depending upon uh, the length of the book. So. Um, here we are, lesson 18. So as always, I start by having you recall last time. So the last time we were together, we read a desert scrapbook, and then we talked about the author's purpose, which means like, what was the author trying to do by writing this book? So kiddos, take a second and talk to that grown up or your brother, sister, or friend, cousin, whoever is with you, and tell them what was this book all about? So adults, pause here. So now hopefully you're coming back after talking about this. This was a really interesting book and we spent a lot of time talking about the genre. So we were thinking about um, what type of genre this book is and we discovered it's a narrative as all of these books are going to be, which means they're a story, but it is an informational story. So it's, it's sort of a mixture of an informational or a, a narrative nonfiction and a journal personal narrative type book. So it's kind of an interesting crossover. So the author's purpose was to tell us the story, but to teach us information. The major goal was teaching us information about the Sonoran Desert. So thinking about that as we transition into this new story. So this is by uh, Vera B. Williams, and she's the one who wrote A Chair for My Mother. Um, she's written a lot of really great books that uh, kids in Boston can really relate to. So this one is called Three Days on a River in a Red Canoe by Vera B. Williams. Now, as always, I'm going to ask you to predict and use some clues. So looking at the title, the illustration, and other clues here on the cover, make a prediction of what kind of a book you think this is going to be, what kind of purpose do you think this author might have, right? What are they trying to do? So let me read it again. Three days on a river in a red canoe. So pause here, turn and talk. So hopefully now you're coming back and you've chatted about what you think this book might be about. Um, I know I always pick up on this clue of the pattern around here. It looks almost like a notebook, which makes me connect back to this scrapbook we just read because it was sort of like somebody's notes and this is almost making it seem like it's somebody's notes too just because it looks like a notebook and then i also noticed too that the drawings here look kind of like kids drawings sorry the dog see the neighbor dog <laughs> Um, so we are trying this video outside. Hopefully the wind and sun will cooperate and you'll be able to hear me okay. So fingers crossed. So you predicted, um, Shyla, uh, you predicted what you thought this book would be about. And um, I know that I have some predictions too. And I was talking about how this picture almost looks like it's drawn by a child. So no, enough, sorry. <laughs> Okay, so let's read a little bit of this. This is called Three Days on a River in a Red Canoe. I was the one who first noticed the red canoe for sale in a yard on the way home from school. This is really hard to see with a reflection. My mom and Aunt Rose and my cousin Sam and I put our money together and bought it. 
the people who sold it to us threw in two old paddles and two big old life jackets. Now I wanted to talk about two sort of terms in that on that page that might be kind of confusing if you've never seen them before. So one of those terms is we put our money together. So what that means is that everybody sort of pitched in and, and contributed a little bit to be able to buy the canoe. Then there's another expression in there that says they threw in. Now that doesn't mean they literally threw in the paddles and life jackets, that wouldn't be safe. But they were saying, okay, if you buy the canoe, we'll also give you these paddles and give you these old life jackets. So they threw them in, they, they added that to the sale. As soon as we got home with the canoe, Aunt Rose and Mom took out their maps. The canoe trips they had taken before Sam or I was even born were marked in colors. They found a three-day trip that could be re just right for us. Then we made lists of what we needed, then we went shopping. Here are Sam and I uh, in the store in new life jackets. They cost a lot, but Aunt Rose and Mom agreed we had to have them and an extra paddle and 20 feet of new rope. We also bought some packages of freeze-dried chicken and some dried apricots. Now, this might be a good time to stop and quickly think about if you've ever been camping before. So if you've ever been camping before, you can think about what that was like. If you've never been camping, you have to kind of imagine that you are out in the woods or out uh, in this case on a river, and you don't have your bathroom, you don't have your kitchen, you don't have your bed. So thinking about what that may, might be like and what you might have to do to be prepared to live out in nature for a few days. So this might be a good time to talk together. Okay, what might you have to do? What might you have to get? How would you be prepared to really live out there without the normal things you use every day? So if you want to chat about that, pause the video here. Otherwise, I'll just keep going. Let me move you back a little bit. Here is everything we need for the trip. The food is packed in tight waterproof sacks. My cat Six Toes is sitting on a sleeping bag. I wanted to take him, but mom says a canoe trip is no place for a cat. I promised Six Toes to bring him back a fish. Next to my shoes and Sam's shoes are new pocket knives. We never even noticed Aunt Rose buying them for us in the store today. Now there's a lot of details here. I'll hold this up for a second so you can really look. <laughs> here we are on our way early in the morning. And then look at this. <laughs> it says we drove and 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 drove. <laughs> That's a fun way of really showing that a lot of time passed. They spent a lot of time in the car. They didn't spend one page on the car and then another page on the car and then another page on the car. That wouldn't be the most interesting book. But in order to let us know that all that time was passing, they found a fun way. Vera B. Williams found a fun way to show us that time was passing as they drove in the car. We drove all day. Oh, look in here, it continues. We drove and drove. <laughs> we drove all day. Now we are at the place Aunt Rosie and Mom had chosen for our first camp. We start on the river in the morning. Sam and I unloaded the car. Mom and Aunt Rosie put up the tent. We hurried to get inside before it got too dark and the mosquitoes took too many bites out of us. We lay in our tent listening to the river. When I poked my head out in the morning, everything was wet, yet it wasn't even raining. We couldn't see our car. We could hardly see the river. So what might that be if it was, if everything was wet, but it didn't rain, how could everything be wet? Hmm. 
Well, I know they gave us the clue. It said we could hardly see, we couldn't see our car. We could hardly see the river. And then look at this clue here. Look how they drew that picture. Can you tell what they're trying to show us? What they're trying to show us with this picture? I think they're trying to show us that it was kind of foggy. Now, foggy means all the clouds were really low. And instead of being able to see clearly like you can see me right now, it's, it's like misty and hard to see. And that's why everything got wet is because those clouds condensed or left little bits of water on everything. We carried our canoe down to the water anyway. That's the wrong way. Here we go. Here we are setting out for a small island. It shows on the map. We packed all our things into the canoe. We're going to fix our breakfast on the island when the sun warms up the river and dries up the mist. Look at that. That is a very misty day. So we haven't seen anything like this in our books yet. But this is a map, so, sort of a map, but also sort of a story. It's showing us where they went on their trip. So it says, our first morning on the river. And it starts over here. It says, this is where we come out of the mist. And then the river goes like this. I am making the first fire of the trip. Sam tries paddling. I try paddling. We find crayfish. We eat our lunch on top of the cliff. It's an apartment house for swallows. We get to the bottom fast. A good swimming hole. We canoe on. Here are mom and auntie, aunt Rosie paddling into a part of the river like a hot green tunnel. I fell asleep. I think Sam did too. It's good mom and Rosie didn't. Right here is where they heard the roaring of the waterfall, but they had been listening for it. It was marked on their maps. Here I am looking over the edge. See how that water, they drew that to show the waterfall right here. Oh my gosh, how are they going to get down that waterfall? That's where the river goes. Well, let's see how they solve that problem. Look at them. Auntie Rosie and Mom are lowering the canoe by ropes down over the waterfall. Sam and I climb up and down until we have carried all the gear to the bottom. We are going to camp here, even though it's still early. Here's our shower. Here are mom and aunt Rosie paddling into a part of, oh, I already read that. <laughs> now this is an interesting new part of the book. This is our kitchen. Aunt Rosie is the cook tonight. We're going to try the crayfish we caught along with our chicken and rice. For dessert, aunt Rosie showed us how to cook fruit stew and dumplings. This is the sink. Now, obviously it's not really a sink, but she keeps describing the parts of the river that they're using to do the things they need to do. So even though they didn't have a real sink, this is the area they use like a sink. This is the sink. You can stand right in it. The rocks make all the shelves and drain boards you need. We use the sand as a scouring powder. So basically, instead of using soap, they just can take sand and rub it inside the pots to clean them out. Mom shows us some knots we can use to tie up the canoe and putting it and in putting up the tent. So look, here is our first set of directions. They're teaching us how to tie these knots. So this is, says two half hitches. One, pass the rope around a tree or stump. Two, with your left hand, hold the rope at the point where it crosses over the longer part of the rope. Three, with your right hand, reach through the loop for the short end of the rope. Pull the end through and tighten the loop. And then step four is to repeat two and three. So now you go back to two and then you do three. And then you'll have two half hitches. Five. 
fire. You don't need a bonfire to cook on. Aunt Rosie made this kind of fire. She kept it hot by adding small sticks. So here is the recipe to make dumplings. One cup dumpling pancake mix, one half cup water. Mix, make a well, so that basically means you put the powder and then you sort of use your finger to dig a little hole. Make a well in the mix. Pour in most of the water. Mix quickly. Use only enough water to make the dough as thick as soft ice cream. Lumps don't matter. Push little spoonfuls of dumpling onto the simmering fruit as fast as you can. Cover, cook until the dumplings are just done, but not hard, about 10 minutes. So that's kind of what it looks like right there. And then here's the recipe for fruit stew. Three handfuls of dried apricots or peaches, honey or sugar to taste, about three cups of water. Add enough water to the plastic bag to cover the fruit. Do this when you first make camp. When you are ready to cook, put the fruit, all the water, and the sweetener in a pot. Cover and boil slowly. Stir often. Do, don't let the apricots burn. Now that is underlined. That is extremely important. If water cooks away, add more. This fruit stew should be juicy. Cook till apricots are soft, about half an hour. P.S. Don't burn your tongues. We burned ours. So they didn't wait till it was cool. Sam and I put up the tent by ourselves. Aunt Rosie told me to use the back of the axe head. Sam used a rock. It's hard to get the pegs in tight so they don't pull out. You have to pull the cords tight too so, the, uh, so that the tent won't be like an old balloon. And you have to, be, to tie a kind of knot that can untie easily. This is an extra roof called a fly. The tent clothing uh, cloth has to let air in so by itself it can't be waterproof. After supper, we build up our fire and sit beside it. Mom tells us stories about the animals that like the nighttime. We watch the stars and the sparks of our fire going up to join them. Sam isn't much of a weather predictor, but the rain didn't bother us. We put up the tent so well, hardly a drop of water came through. In the morning, we sat up in our sleeping bags and ate crackers and raisins. Aunt Rosie made cocoa on the camping stove. That's interesting. I feel like we missed something almost. Yep, it says Sam isn't much of a weather predictor. Hmm. I wonder if they're talking about this that almost looks like that that's supposed to be rain maybe in the picture. We set out on the river with all of our things, even though it was pouring rain. I was shaking my paddle at the sky and yelling. And look at, there it is in the picture. Suddenly, as we came around the bend in the river, the sun came out through a hole in the clouds. A big rainbow spread across the sky. The rainbow faded away and fish started to jump all around us. We got the fishing lines uh, uh, baited and into the water. Sam caught the first fish. Then I caught one. Then Aunt Rosie caught two in a row. After we spread out our things to dry on the sandy beach. What Mom and Aunt Rosie like to do best is take the canoe through fast moving water. They can follow all the curves of the current. In the afternoon, we canoe without stopping. Sam and I paddle too. We came to a place where the river spread out through a meadow. A meadow is like um, a field with tall grass. Grass grows right out of the water and we canoed in the grass. It came up over our heads and hit us. Aunt Rosie put her, head, or her hand over my mouth so I wouldn't frighten away the moose and her calf. But even so, 
when they got wind of us, they ran right back into the woods. So, but even so is a way of saying, even though we tried to be quiet, they still left, right? Even, but even so. And then to, it says they got wind of us. So to get wind of means to sort of smell. Uh, in this case, it means like sort of to smell us. They could smell us in the wind. Um, but really that expression means to like find out, to find out about something. When we discovered this island, we all agreed it was the place to spend our third night. We plan to sleep right out under those trees. So they're saying that instead of sleeping in the tent, they're going to sleep right out on the ground under the trees. The tent is up just in case of rain. The Big Dipper is out. The Milky Way is spread right across the sky. There isn't one mosquito because of the breeze. That breeze turned into a wild wind in the middle of the night. Mom says it was almost hurricane strength. We caught the tent and the canoe just before the wind carried them off down the river. We did lose one pot and one cup. We spent the rest of the night curled up in the bushes. The branches creaked and whooshed all night long. In the morning, we can't believe this is the same river. It's so still. Twigs and leaves and flowers float around us as we start our last day on the river. We watch a muskrat swimming. A heron dives for a fish. We feed crumbs to the ducks. Cows watch us having a river visit. We canoe through a town. We come to a low stone bridge. Sam gets excited. He stands up to wave. Mom yells, sit down. I reach over and pull him down. Now this is a turn and talk moment. Pause the video here and talk about, okay, why are they screaming at him to sit down? And why did she pull him? So pause here. So did you make a prediction that something would happen if he stood up like that? Maybe you thought the canoe would tip. Maybe you thought he would fall out. Can you give me a thumbs up if that's what you were thinking? Well, let's see. Aunt Rosie and Mom brace hard on the other side. This keeps our canoe and everything in it from turning over. But Sam ends up in the water. He swims to the rope Aunt Rosie throws out to him, and we tow him to shore. Mom doesn't say much, but she looks upset. Aunt Rosie looks scared. She, Sam changes to dry clothes, and we canoe on. So if you predicted something like that, you were right on the money. Just past the train bridge, Aunt Rosie asks Sam to stand up and see what's ahead. He gets up as though the canoe were a baby's cradle. So that's another figure of speech. We've got a lot of figures of speech in this book. That's another figure of speech. He stood up as though the canoe were a baby's cradle. So they're saying that because of what happened before, this time he stood up really carefully. He reports that the river is ending in a big lake. He says it looks like the edge of the world on the other side. Aunt Rosie says that's because we're coming to the town dam. So the dam is um, like a wall that people build to hold water in. Mom points the canoe to cross the lake. There's no current and the wind is against us. I'm glad it's slow going. When we get to the other side, our trip will be over. And here we are taking our canoe out, of the, out on the bank. Aunt Rosie showed me on the map where the river goes from here. She says it travels through rocky places with lots of rapids. Someday, after lots of practice, we can go there. But now we must catch a fish for my cat Six Toes. And Aunt Rosie is going to talk with the other campers and find a lift, so a ride, someone who can drive her, back to our car, Ladybug so we can get home tonight. Mom says canoeing back up the river against the current would be very hard, even if we had the time. Way past midnight, we turn into our own street. One by one, we stumble into the house. 
I go to sleep to the sound of six toes chewing on his fish. It seems I can still hear the sound of the river running over the rocks. So that's the end of our story. Take a moment and pause here and just talk together. What part of this story sticks in your mind? Like when you think about it, is there a part of this story that you remember first? And then come back. So hopefully you just talked about um, what part you're remembering. I know I think the part that sticks with me the most is the storm. Like when they wake up to their stuff being blown away, I just can't imagine that seems like it would be very, very scary. Um, I don't know what your favorite, what part stuck with you. So now let's think about the genre. So there are things about it that were similar to this one. And there were things about it that were different. So take a moment now, and that's actually going to be the main focus of our conversation. We're going to have these three, there's three questions left. And the first one is really how we get all those ideas organized, which is our last Venn diagram for the time being. We're going to compare a desert scrapbook and three days on a river in a red canoe. So I want you to think about what was the same in these stories and what was different. So pause here and really take the time Re listen to whatever you need to again so that you can really do that Venn diagram and then come back and I'll show you some things I want you to notice. So now that you have talked together, there's a few things I do want you to notice. So one of the first and most important things to, re to realize is that both of these books were narrative, right? They were both stories someone was telling. So that's the first thing that would go in the middle. Right, that's true about both of the books. They're both narrative. It's also really important to notice they were both personal narrative. They were about that person. They weren't telling a story about somebody else. They were talking about themselves, their experience. So they are both from the first person. So right here in the middle, they are first person or personal narratives. They are about the person writing it. <clears throat> Pardon me, something that's different, this one was a scrapbook, right? They put, she put in drawings, she included photographs, she included um, things she taped in like feathers. Whereas this one was really just a story with drawn pictures to go with it. So that's something that was a little different. We thought the author's purpose of this first book, of this scrapbook, was although it was a story, we really felt like the purpose was to teach us about the desert. What about this one? What do you think the author's purpose was here? Was she trying to teach us about rivers? Everything we need to know about rivers? Was she trying to entertain us with a fun and funny story? Now, there's a lot of different opinions on that and sometimes it's a little bit of more than one thing. So take a moment to talk together, thinking about those three main things, right? An author's purpose is usually one of three things. Either they're just trying to entertain you, it's just for fun. They're trying to teach you something give you information on something or they're trying to convince you right make you believe a certain thing or want a certain thing or do a certain thing so talk together about what the author's purpose might be and then we'll come back so I know when I think about this one it, it feels like it might be a mixture like it doesn't feel like she's trying to convince me of anything I don't feel like she's trying to make me believe anything but I feel like it's she's definitely telling a story for enjoyment but I feel like she's also trying to teach us a little bit about camping. And the part that makes me feel like she's definitely trying to teach us something is if we go back to, remember where she was giving us directions? She was teaching us how to tie knots, how to cook dumplings, and how to make fruit stew. So those things really are clues to me that it was more than just about telling a story for fun. She was also trying to teach us a little bit about what it might be like to go camping. So it's kind of a mixture of two things. But this is a personal narrative, and sometimes personal narratives can still include a little bit of nonfiction too. Um, and then the last thing, no, that's it. So the, this is the main piece to think about. We've already discussed the author's purpose and the genre. So those are the main things for now. I did have four, I added one as I was reading. Um, I did have four ideas for you of things you can do to follow up this lesson, this um, book. So the first one is um, if you have an older child uh, or a child who's really into language, this book is a really great gateway into terms of speech, like um, figurative language, 
um, turns of phrase, idioms, things like that, where it said they threw in the paddles um, um, as if it were a baby's cradle, right? So those were sort of um, turns of phrase that can confuse kids if they just read it literally all the time. So what would be a really great like second, third, fourth, fifth grade even activity would be to have them start um, like a little notebook of idioms or turns of phrase like that. Because we use so many idioms that we don't even realize. It's just such a part of our culture here in the United States. And so, and, and other cultures have their own and they're different. So that would be a really great project would be to start learning different phrases or expressions and keeping track of what they really mean. So for example, um, the whole nine yards, right? That's a funky expression. We use it all the time, but not always really understanding where it came from. So maybe you want your child to learn the origin of that expression and then what that expression really means. So that's up to you. That could be a nice project and that could continue over time. You know, have, a, have an idiom notebook or something like that. So that's my first idea. My second idea is to just do exactly what this author did. And it's sort of like what I asked you to do with this one. Tell a story. Is there a great trip you went on as a family? Is there a special day you had that you could write down? I'm sure your teachers have had you write personal narratives in school, so it's really great to have the time to write your own at home. My third idea is actually to go back to, of course I keep flipping by it, to go back to this page and do one of two things. Try making this recipe, right? Try following those directions. You can take a quick screenshot, I'll hold this up. Take a quick screenshot of this page, save that, those directions, and try making it at home. Or, if that feels a little bit too much for you, you can take the time to write your own. You know, maybe you have a, a recipe that you work on as a family all the time. Maybe you make pizzas together or a special pasta dish or a great salad. So whatever it is that you, that you feel, feel comfortable cooking, you, that's a really great form of writing, especially for younger ones. So this is great for even as early as four, writing step-by-step -step directions. So the great thing is that the spelling doesn't have to be perfect. It's really about helping them organize and write the sequential steps of how to do something. And the fourth and final um, idea for you of an extension from this activity would be to learn some knot tying. This is not a very common hobby anymore, um, but certainly scouts often learn things like that. Um, I will attach a resource down below of a link, a couple links to places where you can follow directions to learn how to tie knots. Um, I'll put this back up again if you want to take a screenshot of the directions here for two half hitches. But there's a lot of really great knots out there and it's just really good practice, especially if you have a child who um, has some like visual spatial challenges, if, if sort of eye hand coordination is a hard thing. Um, knot tying can be really great because it, it's forcing you to cross your hemispheres. So the brain, right, the two parts of your brain control the opposite side of the body. And so for kids who have coordination issues, things that make them cross their hemispheres using their right hand to go to the left, left hand to go to the right, um, you know, going across that midline, those are really important for building um, some strength in the, in the brain to control your body. So that's a really great activity and I hope you enjoy. So thank you for being here for lesson 18. Um, I will be recording some more soon. See you.